A day in the life of Matt Talbot began somewhere about two o'clock in the morning when he rose from his bed to pray. He left the house about five and made his way to Mass, usually in the Jesuit church in Gardiner Street. My mother saw that I was up in good time every morning and I used to take the keys and open the church. When I got to know uh, Matt Talbot, it was, I think, much later when I got to know his name. Uh, he was always standing at the door, hail, rain or snow. He'd be there at the door, sometimes kneeling on the, on the steps of the door, waiting for it to be opened. And I opened and he, he went in, and he usually went to the side altar, the uh, Blessed Virgin's altar, and he prayed there. Back in Rutland Street, he took a quick breakfast of cocoa and dry bread and then headed off down to his place of work in the city's dockland. His route lay down Killarney Street, past the Five Lamps and under the railway bridge in the North Circular Road. I took him down Killarney Street. He used to meet my dad, sad morning coming down Killarney Street. He walked down to, down to the shop with him to a very late o'clock mass. Trousers was always loose and they'd come up, in, up over the knees. He'd kneel down on his bare knees. He used to get into a little corner to himself. No, put a bother on anybody. During his long years with the firm of TNC Martins, Matt had to do many different kinds of work. In his early days there, he worked at loading and unloading from ships and drays and handcarts. He disliked working in the docks, not because the work was hard, but because he was offended by some of the language among the men working there. Another work which he disliked was the loading and unloading of poles from the creosoting machine. And he asked the foreman not to be given that duty. He explained that he went to Holy Communion every morning and he didn't like to approach the altar with his clothes smelling of creosote. Towards the end of his life, he was given the job of storekeeper in the part of the yard known as Castle Forbes, where he had the responsibility of opening the gates in the morning and closing them at night. He also had the duty of selecting timber for special orders and loading it onto the handcart for removal. Matt carried out his work very conscientiously and won't betide anyone who tried to take even a piece of waste timber for his own use without permission. During the normal working day, there were many short periods when the men were free to chat or smoke for a few minutes while they waited for the next job to come along. Matt had his own way of spending these free periods. You see when uh, Tony Casper and I kneeling down praying and uh, when he'd be coming out, I'd call him, I wouldn't let him see me or call him. I'd see him brushing down his Turned down his trousers there and had to be praying, putting the book in his pocket. And when I'd go up, Matt would be in behind the pile until I'd come back. Of course, he could do nothing until I'd, I'd come back to load the yoke again, do you see? In the yard, he had a little shed that he called his office. And in there, he kept all his things for work, jackets and pencils and chalk. And we'd love to get in there, of course, to pull it around. And then, uh, <clears throat> do you remember one day, Mona, we went in and Matt was kneeling down yes. on the Speak up here now. on the log. And we found um, Matt with his arms outstretched. And we wondered what he was doing. We didn't understand he was praying. So we came home and told Mammy. Old Matt had his arms outstretched. And of course, Mammy said, well, no, you're not to laugh. Holy Matt was praying. Bit by bit, I'd say he started the fast. Like, he didn't start to do all those things all at one time. As each year he went along, he went, like, deeper and deeper into his mode of penance. We had a house in Castle Forbes Yard. Well, then Matt was there for the men's lunch hour. And I made what he called his lunch. It consisted of a scrap of tea and a scrap of cocoa mixed together made with boiling water and allowed to get stone cold, taken without milk or sugar. I handed it out to him from my back door and he went away down the yard and he ate his lunch, which consisted of the mixture I told you of and a bit of bread. Yes, he always had a, a pebble in his mouth. Well, he didn't drink. He didn't drink anything, you see, like uh, water. He wouldn't drink, drink, have a drink of water in the summertime. And he said that the pebble used to keep his mouth moistened. Some evenings I'd be home with Matt, and some other evenings I'd be trying to dodge him. 
for the simple reason that I might be going to a football match or something like that, and I often tail behind them. For the simple reason is that when you were with him, he always felt like compelled to go into the church. He always went to Lawrence O'Toole's church on the way home. Although he'd never ask you, no, he'd never command you or anything, but you always felt like bound to go in allow him. It was usually about half past six when Matt arrived back in Rutland Street for his principal meal of the day. It hardly deserves the name of meal, since as often as not, it consisted of nothing more substantial than a couple of slices of bread washed down by a cup of tea or cocoa. Well, anyway, this, it was on a Friday evening, and I came in for water, and Mrs. Spiderman was over there washing the fish. And I, I said to her, those are lovely fishes, because they were nice, you know. So she said, um, I said to her, Matt likes the fish, so she says, Matt not eat the fishes, you see. And of course, I said, oh, is that so? Now, I didn't understand it at the time. So she said, Matt neither eats fish or flesh on the seven weeks. Oh, God help me, I said, you know. I'd all this sympathy for him. Her and ever there. Uh, and she said, what are you going to do with the fish? Or she says, my husband will eat the fish. Her husband is baker. Matt spent the rest of the evening in his room, unless with some sodality or other he wished to attend. He passed the time in reading and prayer, surrounded by his books, the pictures of the saints, and the crucifix to which he directed his most fervent prayer. Oh, when we go up to his room, he'd be always kneeling in prayer, and when you'd duck at the door, he'd real abrupt, he'd say, who's there? And I'd say, it's Susan. Come in, Susan. <laughs> Come in, Susan, he'd say. Then we'd sit and have a chat. But then he'd think that he'd never, we'd never go for to kneel down again and pray.